Well, good morning. It is Monday morning, and Sean and I were just talking about what a beautiful morning. We wake up, and a little bit of haze, but sunshine out and spurting off all that haze. So, oh, I, uh, I don't know about you, but I had the same experience yesterday as far as with just the beauty of the day, and, and after a week of, of depressing gray smoke, um, just feeling really good about just, oh, thank you, Lord. Um, so, um, we are just at the beginning of this study of um, Paul's letters um, from prison, Radical Discipleship, and we are starting with his letter to uh, the church in Ephesus, and um, we, are, we are putting aside, or we're getting working our way through preliminary matters um, as far as just kind of introducing ourselves to uh, this letter, getting thinking about background information, uh, because God's word to us was first of all God's word to them, and as we want to listen um, to what God's word said to them so that it helps us with the interpretation, this sort of material helps us. Um, and and that one of the analogies that I gave last week is in particular, when we're listening and we're studying letters, um, a letter is a conversation. It's a one-sided conversation, um, but it, it there's some relational context. There's, you know, in, in most instances in the New Testament, um, Paul has a very good idea of what's going on in the church, and he is responding to issues. He was um, a church founder, and and they would. He would get in. He would get news, whether from one of his colleagues who was there, um, or just from the church looking for advice, help, um, and and so in that, that's that part where, uh, because there's that relational context, there, there's background information, and so um, they know something. Paul knows something, and we hear Paul responding, and so the analogy is is that when you're interpreting a letter. Um, it's a little bit like hearing one side of um, a phone conversation. And the more that we can kind of understand where the other side's coming from and what Paul is responding to, um, greater insight uh, will be given into just understanding um, the message of the letter. Also trying to give you um, some tools, techniques, ideas about when you when you decide that you want to study something, um, and you know, and one of those tools that I've talked about is um, there's books that are called commentaries. You can always um, purchase a commentary. Um, you know, depending on your experience, if you if you've never done it before, I would recommend um, uh, a commentary that's not too technical. And um, N. T. Wright has a good series, The New Testament for Everyone. He's a great biblical scholar, and so um, and and he's writing um, really with um, a non-scholar in mind. And then after time, if you you know you, you continue to enjoy this sort of thing, then you you know you could you could do it again, get a more technical commentary. But technical doesn't always necessarily mean better. Um, so you you can read a commentary, but the other thing trying to do is is to go. But some of the things that commentaries do, you can do. And we left off with that last week, where um, uh, talked about the fact that, in particular with Paul's letters, one of the things that we can do is we can, um, we can turn to the book of Acts. And we're going to start with that in, in just a moment. Um, I'm going to just say a prayer for us. want to say welcome. Uh, if you're if you're here live, just a reminder, um, you can share prayer requests and um, share your questions. If you're watching um, this later by tape, uh, you can still uh, send in questions and we'll be happy to address those. Uh, but let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for this day. We praise for, again, the beauty. And uh, Lord, as we... Uh, have the opportunity to hear your word today and uh, think about um, 
the Apostle Paul, the way that you work through him, um, the, this letter that he wrote, this letter that you wrote through him. Um, we pray your Holy Spirit to bless us, uh, that um, we would, we through this study, would come to a greater understanding uh, of this book and um, and it would mean Lord that your word would be walking with us even more strongly that it would be in our minds and our hearts um, that there will be times through this study that your Holy Spirit will will really burn onto our hearts um, truth that comes from you that we might live better in Jesus name Amen so, um, a little, uh, I don't know if it's an advantage of being able to do a Bible study with one of the pastors or not, but um, I'm going to share with you just a little bit because I, you might be interested in this. Um, but uh, yesterday afternoon, I met with uh, the task force on reopening, and I had asked as far as for people to pray for us because uh, we're working through this process of getting to quickly as we can the opportunity um, to be able to have people join on Sunday morning um, with us in, in worship and not just online anymore. We, we plan on continuing with the online opportunity, um, realize that some people are going to be in high-risk situations, and, um, and so you're going to wait. And... Um, and one of the nice things is, is that, you know, what we've been doing with the online, we plan to continue to do, um, you know, all, without ceasing, you know, and that'll, so that if you're out of town, um, you know, we've had people who um, have been at West, you know, or are West Siders, but they've been scattered around the country, uh, they're joining with us and, and um, continuing to find home here even while they're away um, and and we've also found that we've had new people join with us and a little bit like our hope with alpha um, it may be that for some people starting online may be a more comfortable starting point than, than trying to come in person so we'll continue the online stuff but here's the plan um, the plan is is that we are going to have a practice run through with um, our task force team uh, on the 4th. We're going to expand that out to leadership on the 11th. Um, and then we are going to have um, the system up running. People can make reservations um, and, and participate um, on the 18th. At this point, what we're planning is to have two service times, 9 and 11, um, and two venues in each service time. Uh, the South Sanctuary and the North Sanctuary. And in the North Sanctuary, and the South Sanctuary, um, I'll preach live during the nine o'clock hour. And then, in the, and then in the North Sanctuary, um, everything will be um, uh, um, streamed live um, via video and so people in there will there'll be i think we'll have a, a potentially still have to work through this detail a worship leader in the room um, but um, you'll see the worship team and and me through the video screen um, we're gonna we're gonna be working hard um, once we start on the that would be the 18th um, to maybe in just a couple of weeks be to the place where we'll have children's Sunday school available for Sunday morning. Um, but we want to get things going. We're going to have this run through. We're going to see how it all works out. We're going to get the team up and running because it'll be a little bit different. There's going to be a reservation system. There's going to be somebody checking people in at the door. There's going to be somebody in the, um, in the lobby uh, helping you know where to go. There's going to be somebody uh, helping actually seat people in the sanctuary. And so, so 
you know, the, and, and in the beginning, there's all of those people are going to be highly trained as far as what we're doing um, with our mitigation um, and response as far as with COVID. So we work through those details. Um, and then in the nine o'clock live in the South service, um, streamed to the North service, uh, which is in the main building. In the 11 o'clock um, in the South building, we will have another contemporary service. That one will be um, being led through the same um, video that we produced at the nine o'clock hour. And in the and in the north building, in the main building, we will um, we are going to have a traditional service, and um, and then I'll be preaching live at that as well. Um, we'll just have a piano and um, and then a worship leader, and um, and all of these are based upon the stipulations uh, given to us by the state. So very excited that we are are heading in that direction. And, um, and getting everything ready so that, um, you know, hopefully we, we do this pretty smoothless, smoothly, flawlessly. And, um, uh, and we have options as far as expanding um, that if we end up having more than 200 people who are wanting to make reservations, um, because that's kind of the limit right now for Sunday morning, uh, that... We have, we have some ideas on how we could expand that out. But that's what we're starting with. The online experience will move from 9.45 to 9 o'clock in the morning. And, um, and so those, those will be our first steps back. Thought, thought you might like to hear that. And um, obviously, uh, you heard it first here. I have that little advantage of doing a Bible study with me. Um, and I'm going to be producing that content to send out. Um, and give information to people um, by tomorrow. Question? Somebody just wanted to clarify that they will be able to watch on Facebook at 9. You, yeah, the question was, so we will continue with the online. Um, the only difference will be is that we will move um, the start time for the online service to 9 o'clock. Um, but, yep. And a little bit of, a, of also a warning. Um, I'm actually I'm I'm gonna send an, a letter or an email in to the to the state agency that oversees these things just to give input a little bit that you know some of the the way that the regulations have been written uh, you, you know seems I, I would say a little bit um, uninformed about how churches approach worship for Sunday morning and um, you know it seems like they. They wrote this presuming that, you know, maybe all worship on Sunday morning is done by orchestras. I, I don't know, but, you know, we don't, we don't typically call what we do a musical performance, and we don't typically call the congregation an audience um, because we're all worshipers. Um, but more than that, the stipulation is, is that, you know, you can only have one accompanist with, um, a, with somebody who is singing. And, uh, you know, and we're left there going, explain to me how somebody playing the bass, playing the guitar, being on the drums, mask, changes any dynamic about safety in the room when it comes to the spread of COVID. Um, and, and basically the way the regulations are written now, it doesn't allow us to actually have the worship team in the room with us live. And so at this point, we're going to have to actually tape the the worship team and what whatever service you're in you won't be experiencing a live worship team you'll be experiencing one via tape doesn't make sense to me but you know in order to get things going decently in order uh, that's what we're going to have to do okay um so acts uh chapter 19 um While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the. Now we're going to approach Acts differently. We're not. We're not. We're not going to try to do a deep dive study. We just want to become familiar with it because it's giving us a little bit of the background. We know that there's most likely, based on 
our other research so far, there's a, there's, there's a time gap between when this happened and when Paul's writing. But it tells us something, and, and this is the part where um, we have an idea who Paul is. We, we talked about him last week. If you missed the study of last Wednesday, I encourage you to go back. Um, go to the website, www.westsidechurchrichland.org. Uh, West, um, Look under videos, and you'll find this Bible study. And boom, there you go. Get the background information. I gave you a lot of history about Paul last week that's helpful, about just thinking about him, his experience. And... Um, and now we're shifting a little bit because this is a two-sided conversation and we, and we know less about the other side, which is this, the, the group of Christians in Ephesus, and we're trying to understand a little bit about them. And so one way into this that, that is available to all of us is we have the book of Acts. So we, we come to this, we read through it. Um, he found disciples and asked them, at Ephesus, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Uh, so Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? Well, John's baptism. So they, they believe in Jesus, but they haven't been fully introduced to the Christian faith. Um, that there's some, this is an oddity, this is, and this isn't unusual, and, it, and, and this is a part where it doesn't set a precedent for this expectation that you become a Christian and you don't get baptized by the Holy Spirit. There's some traditions in the church that have what's called second baptisms of the Holy Spirit. What we believe is that um, when you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that He raised, that God raised Him from the dead, you're saved. And salvation means being born again. And being born again means the Holy Spirit comes and He lives inside of you. Now, when the Holy Spirit comes and he lives inside of you, what he wants is he wants to be um, the empowering presence of God in your life. And, um, and we talk about this in the Alpha Course, is that oftentimes um, what can happen uh, for a believer's life is that the Holy Spirit is present, but it's, he's present more like a pilot light. He's there, but he's not really giving a lot of heat into or energy or power um, into that person's life. The reason being is that um, we haven't given him the, and the invitation um, to be that empowering presence. We, we haven't been seeking, we haven't been asking, we haven't been praying, um, we haven't been listening, we haven't been following. We can quench the work of the Spirit in our lives through disobedience. You know, and this, is, this becomes the part. Not just be a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. And, um, you know, and, and, and this is the part where actions um, speak louder than merely words. And so, um, you know, and I'll just give you a single example. So, you sit there and you say, you know, Holy Spirit, I want you to lead me and guide me. And then you wake up. And, and you, you actually you read God's Word, which is a good starting point, and you experience the prompting of the Holy Spirit. The, you, you, you're in Matthew. You read the Lord's Prayer. And there you read, forgive us our um, debts as we forgive our debtors. And then you're reading the actual passage of Matthew, and so after um, lead us not into temptation, you then hear the warning of Jesus that anybody who doesn't forgive, their sins won't be forgiven. And, and, and it's even stronger, and you read this and you realize that there's this person in your life that you, that you need to forgive. But you don't. Um, now, the Holy Spirit, do this. I believe you. I want to follow you. Okay, then do this. And then you ignore it. Um, that's quenching, uh, or uh, quel squelching um, the Spirit. That's Or quenching um, His fire. 
And so that's the part where it's like, okay, so we want the Holy Spirit to have his way with us. So there's those traditions. They talk about second baptism. That's not really what this passage is about. We want to be alive to God. We want his Holy Spirit. These people were uninformed. And so we can picture this sense of, oh, I've got more information to share with you. Let me share with you the difference between John's baptism, which was merely a baptism of repentance, and let's make sure that you are fully Christians. So, that's the beginning part. Um, verse 4, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told people to believe in the one who was coming. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Now, in this, um, these, these disciples, um, they are Jews, right? They know the baptism of John, that makes them Jews. So Paul isn't alone in Ephesus, and I talked a little bit about this. There's, there's, God was at work that there were these people who knew John, and they had been disciples of John, and they were, they were looking to be followers of the Messiah. They just didn't have the whole story about Jesus, and now they've become disciples of Jesus. And so Paul's not alone. And then he goes and he preaches um, the gospel among the Jews, which is Paul's way of doing things. If you read through Acts, this is his normal pattern. First to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. Um, he spends three months preaching, um, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of, the, some of them, the Jews, became obstinate. They refused to believe and they publicly maligned the way. Now, this is also something that we find is, you know, here are some of these Jews that were like Paul before his conversion. And they hear this stuff, and instead of becoming followers, they actually become those um, antagonists who want to attack and destroy. Um, so, Paul left. That became the sign. I preached here for three months, and, and some have believed, but the rest are rejecting and becoming hostile. He took the disciples with him, and they had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the provinces of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Now he's shifting. He's taking this into the, in, into the marketplace, this lecture hall of Tyrannus, a place uh, that's picturing philosophical schools sharing their ideas. Now, we will read this, and then I'll give you a little bit of a background that's going to be helpful as we think about Ephesus and Greco-Roman culture and the difference between the schools of philosophy and religions. And because for us, it, you almost flip it upside down. So I'll get there in a moment. Um. Now, he did this, he lectured here um, in the Tyrannus Hall. So this went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Now, notice what happens here is, is that lives in the province of Asia. So, Ephesus is one of the chief cities of the Roman Empire, and it is the chief city at this point of the province of Asia. The province of Asia is one of the provinces of the Roman Empire. Um, and this is where, you know, we, we do more, a little more historical research. Again, your commentaries, your study Bible. There's even a, there's even a thing called an introduction to the New Testament um, where, like, like where you have a study Bible that has a little introductory material right at the beginning of each book, an introduction in the New Testament has all of that, and it's a lot more for every book of the Bible, and it's just a book like that. And, um, and so you can go to those three sorts of places to begin your own research about how do I get this background information and understand it. Um, now, uh, and I think at this point, um, 
let me, I'll give you a little bit of information. Um, if you were in the study of Revelation and you remember that far back, um, we, we looked at Ephesus because um, John was in Ephesus. Ephesus was quite the church overall. Um, you know, Paul founded it. Uh, John, uh, the apostle, later in his life ended up becoming um, one of its leaders. Um, tradition holds that Mary, the mother of Jesus, ended up in Ephesus. Um, and so, um, yeah, quite a few people um, uh, found their home here. Uh, fourth largest city of the Roman Empire. Um, population estimates between um, 125,000 and 225,000, um, which was a large city um, in the ancient world. Fourth largest. Um, major financial center. It's a chief port on the west coast of Asia. Um, uh, it was home to the Pan Ionian Games, which was the second largest um, uh, games outside of the Olympics in the ancient world. Um, Ephesus um, was a city of power, prestige, uh, and accomplishments uh, where the Greco of the Greco-Roman Empire were on display. Um, it was also the center of Artemis worship. And one of the seven wonders of the world, the Temple of Artemis was there. Um, it, along with the Temple in Jerusalem, um, was one of the two largest um, temple buildings built in the ancient world. Um, its temple floor was the size of two football fields. Um, and so then, you know, you sit there and you go, okay, so Who's Artemis? Artemis is um, the Greek goddess of love. Um, and, uh, and, and so this is going to be about sex and fertility. Um, when you think about religion in the ancient world, and then you think about sex and fertility, you're going to think about temple prostitutes. Um, and, and, and now you're starting to go, Religion of the ancient world sounds a lot different than the Christian religion that we've we've had, um, it, you know, as far as in modern times. And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, not only um, is it the Temple of Artemis um, there, you know, that you you have whole, all these different temples, but another significant temple is Dea Roma, which was built um, in 29 BC, um, which is, uh, became a center of the emperor cult. So you have loyalty to the emperor. Um, you know, this is one of the chief cities of the Roman Empire. You have loyalty um, to the god Artemis, and, um, and it's going to mark the city. Um, so this city is the hub that the outlying areas of Asia province look to. Now we see a little bit of the wisdom of Paul. Paul um, has, has been um, led by the Holy Spirit to come into Greece to begin to preach the gospel. And, and, and he's been to Corinth, and now he's in Ephesus. He's dealing with one of the major cities. He's found um, Jewish disciples, and he's found Christian disciples. This, his, his, the gospel is going forward. The church is being built. And not only is the church being built in Ephesus, but, but the presence of Paul and those disciples who are becoming Christians, well, they're becoming disciple makers, because that's what a disciple does. Well, you become a follower of Jesus, and you're going to become somebody who helps other people become followers of Jesus. And so then the gospel is beginning to spread out into um, the province of Asia. And, um, and in fact, um, Colossians is one of these examples where here is a church that um, got founded through Paul, um, but really through his associates. And... Um, and there will be others of these. So exciting stuff. This is, you know, getting this picture about just what God is doing through the church. Um, the gospel is spreading 
um, and finding its way in one of the major provinces of the Roman Empire. Now, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Verse 11, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their Ill illnesses were cured, and evil spirits left them. Some Jews, now, and, and what's God doing? He's affirming that Paul is his spokesman, and this is part of the gospel. This is something that we as Christians should pray for, an expectation that the gospel would go forward in words and deeds with power. Not the power of people, but the power of God. So, we continue to pray for God's miracles. Um, we don't ever want it to be confused with the idea of one particular person. Um, and, and because Paul's teaching the gospel, because he's lifting up Jesus Christ, you know, and because he himself really understands who Jesus is and who he is, this is probably explains a little bit why the power of God's able to work through him because of his faith and the clarity so that this doesn't trip him up. Question. Yeah, so this verse about the handkerchiefs that touched him healing the sick, mm -hmm. there's a church that that gives out handkerchiefs or, or you can ask for one online and they will send you a little handkerchief that they've blessed and prayed over and used anointing oil on and they say it will help heal the sick. What's your take on that? So the question is, is that there's churches that, there's a church online that has this handkerchief. How much do they, so, okay. They're free. Okay, well that's good. Um, this, you know, so they'll, they'll do these things where they pray for these handkerchiefs and send them out and they could help heal the sick. Um, I, so I, I, I have no idea about this, you know. I, I believe in healing and I believe that as the church we should um, pray for miracles and we should pray for signs and wonders. I'm also very skeptical of, of some of the ways that some of the, these people end up teaching. And so it becomes kind of the thing where I've seen very good, positive examples of churches that do healing ministry. I, I, overall, I think Alpha does a great job about um, teaching the church how to lean into um, praying, um, asking, um, desiring for the Holy Spirit's power to be released in, in healing ways in people's lives. Um, I would say that this tends, this seems to be um, not normative, but um, ex um, exceptional. Um, you know, that w what you have here is, is that you have Paul very clearly anointed in the power of the Holy Spirit to be this apostle of the Gentiles. And um, so, yeah, so, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, at this point, I wouldn't see a reason why Westside would get into the ministry of, play, of praying over handkerchiefs and offering to send them out. I think we would be more inclined to, to try to, to just pray. And, and so, yeah. Um, but, you know, anything beyond that, I'd have to, like, you, what you want to do is you really want to analyze their teaching. And, um, you know, and this is the part where some of these things you would call the health and wealth gospel, where, you know, they, be, you know, they get television or online and, you know, and, and then, um, you know, basically they, the, the, their teaching ends up being really poor teaching and sometimes even heresy. And sometimes, you know, like, and I'll, I'll name one of these, like, like Benny Hinn is a well-known health and wealth gospel person. And, um, you know, and, and I, I don't think anybody should give him money. <laughs> I think that it seems like the Benny Hinn show seems more about Benny Hinn than Jesus and about him getting more money so he can buy a jet. And, uh, you know, and that's just sort of... So, you know, that, and that's this part where that this, this can be open to abuse, but just because everything can be open to abuse. And so that's the part where it's like, we are biblical people, so we're gonna 
we're going to listen and live into the truth of the New Testament. And, and this is the part, you know, our West Side, our tradition is Presbyterian, which is the frozen chosen, which are the people who have traditionally, you know, been very skeptical about the, 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 the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. But that's not us. Some Presbyterians did that. But, you know, that, I mean, that's like, but again, they were being weak in their reading of Scripture and, and expectations based on the New Testament. So, you know, that's just what you'll hear from me. Presbycostal. Full of the Spirit. Our minds on fire for God. Bring that all together. Very best thing. Okay. Verse 13. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? And then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating, they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Um, amazing things are happening. Um, the kingdom of God is breaking down um, the gates of hell. When we're talking about people coming out of idolatry, talking about people coming out of um, demon possession, but we also see that some of these things that are going on is, is that you know some of these people get excited and they don't know everything, and and you know and this is the part. Jesus, I know. Paul, I know, but I know nothing about you. Um, and and this is that this is given to us, and, and so that we just see what happened, but also that we would learn from these things. Um, and 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 when we it, it you know the call for battle is the call for disciples, and and you can't just be um, these sons of Sceva who are Jews who hear about these words of power and then they say them and think that 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 power matters. Now, what you're hearing here, which is, which is going to play into our understanding of Ephesians, is that um, Ephesus is a place that's very much open to spiritual realities. Um, words of power, which is another name for magic. This is going to come up. In, in, in our letter to the Ephesians. This is, this, is, this is the flavor of the city. So we see this playing out here. And the name of Jesus is definitely a word of power. Excuse me. But the only one who can use the name of Jesus with power is an actual follower of Jesus. Jesus won't be used by pagan powers to be used by them. This is the living God. Um, when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. God used this. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly, and when they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. That is an incredible amount of money. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. And after all this happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia um, and Achaia. After I had been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He, went, uh, he sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he stayed in the province of Asia. And then we, we hear about this successful thing, and then we hear about the riot in Ephesus. And um, about that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who um, made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in no little business for the craftsmen. He called them together along with the workmen in related trades and said, Men, you know we receive a good income from this business, and you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in particular, the whole province of Asia, he says that man-made gods are no gods at all. There is danger, not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of 
province of Asia and the world will be robbed of her divine majesty. Their income's getting affected. Now, you, we can assume that, you know, they believe all these highfalutin things as well, but, you know, this is the part where the success of Paul's message of the gospel, people are leaving idolatry and all these other gods, and the silversmith is calling together the tradesmen and saying, wait a second, there, this is a threat. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, rushed as one man into the theater. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Now what you realize is a little interesting thing here. You hear about all of Paul's public ministry, and then you hear about one episode in particular towards the end. So it felt like you were all done, but we got to go back and we you, know, you got to hear about this. This is important. It's exciting. The gospel is, again, breaking down the gates of hell. But in this world, you're going to have trouble. If they persecute me, they're going to persecute you. Um, Paul's traveling companions. Oh, Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, verse 30, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. This is a riot. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Just so you know, I, I'll, I'll use this a little bit of an aside. Um, peaceful protests, great. Rioting, not great. Christians don't riot. We don't loot. We're not on the side of anarchy, chaos, violence, um, any of those things. Um, and, you know, we have to say that racism is bad, and we have to say that rioting and looting is bad. And, um, and so, you know, with, in what's happening in our own country, we present an alternative voice um, both to the rioting and to anybody who wants to, to put forward prejudice and racism. Uh, so... The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. Great picture of just how riots work. The Jews pushed Alexander to the front, and some of the crowd shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people, but when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, Great as Artemis of the Ephesians. The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Men of Ephesus, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from heaven? Just so you know, at the center of this Artemis was probably a meteor. And the meteor probably in some way looked like this multi-breasted idol. The typical picture of Artemis, because she's a fertility goddess, is a woman with a woman's head and then hundreds of breasts. And, um, and it's believed that this, this meteor in some way looked like, um, uh, you know, what the goddess would look like in some way. So that's, that's what you're getting reference to there. Um, therefore, since this is our city, this is verse 36, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. You have brought these men here, though they neither rob temples nor blaspheme our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and they are, there are pro-councils. They can press charges. If there is any further you want to bring up, it must be settled in the legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of today's events. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. After he said this, he dismissed the assembly. Um, now this goes on, and um, and and but we have enough of sitting there going. We have this picture, and we see this tenuous tension between the rise of the church in Ephesus. In some ways, the Pax Romana um, actually helping, and we see that that you know peace in a society allows the gospel to go forward. Um, just at the right time, the gospel of Christ comes forward, and yet 
It's going to create disturbance because as we break down the gates of hell, Satan's going to rise up. And, and so, uh, in that background, we should we know as we come to Ephesus that, you know, well, there may be these sorts of tensions. Okay, we looked at Acts. I've given you background information about Ephesians. Um, we know that it's, it's later than this. Um, Paul's in prison. Most likely um, in Rome, probably t um, towards the end of his life, 61, 62 um, is the best guess that we have. And, um, and now we've kind of done our work that we've, we've, we've done the background. Now, next step, you read through the whole thing. We're not going to read, but you may have read. I encourage you, read through the whole thing. Um, you know, I've encouraged to have a pad of paper, write a little bit of an outline. What the outline lets you do is allows you to kind of have your notes, your thoughts. What's this whole letter about? Um, and, you know, and then um, you'll find like in the introduction to the New Testament, in your study Bible, they'll give you an outline. You can compare those things and you can begin your study. We have 15 minutes, which means we get to start the letter to the Ephesians. Um, and um, chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we open this and we know here's a letter. This is pretty much the, a, a typical epistolary opening. Um, you know, we write emails today, we send texts today. You know, if you're young enough, you do Snapchat and these other little video things that you do. Um, uh, and every once in a while, somebody sends a card and, or, or a handwritten letter. Um, we're moving away um, from uh, the written word. Now, in the ancient world, they were an oral society. But there was an educated elite, and they and and writing um, was really, if you wanted to communicate off dif across distances, was necessary. And so, writing, um, they, some people spent their lives um, as scribes, and it became an art form. Um, and letter writing became an art form. And if you were educated, you would get trained in these things. And so, this is the part where. You know we're gonna we're we're gonna lean in a little bit in our as we as we become students of scripture, you know to, to listen to some of these resources. This is this is a letter. Now, first you get the person who's writing. Now Paul may not actually be the actual one writing, um, is very much, but he's the one at least dictating. Paul, <clears throat> an apostle. Okay. So, the word apostle literally is a messenger with authority. Um, and, and, you know, they're basically like an ambassador. They have been commissioned to be representative of a king or an empire or, or you know, some ruler or person of power. And, they get, and they've been sent to represent the message of this person um, and deliver it. So... We distinguish in the church between the apostles and the rest of the disciples. Um, every once in a while you'll find the word apostle, and it literally just means its basic meaning is a messenger with authority. In Romans we hear about Junia, and she's described in this apostle, and we wouldn't look at her to be an apostle as the same way as the twelve. In the New Testament we have the twelve, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, um, no, not Matthew, those are the Gospels. So Matthew, Peter, James, John, um, Simon the Zealot, um, Bartholomew. Uh, you know, so we, we've got the, the original 12. Judas died. They picked another in Acts. And, and then we have Paul, who is affirmed by the church in Jerusalem, is called by Jesus Christ, 
and he's called as the apostle to the Gentiles. And, um, and so when we think about Paul as an apostle, we're thinking about that category of apostolic authority. Here is this messenger, and Paul says, chosen by Christ Jesus by the will of God. Um, the authority doesn't reside in him, it resides in Jesus and the one who sends him. So, Paul, an apostle, um, speaking the very words of God, speaking on behalf of Jesus Christ. Now, notice it says Christ Jesus. Um, uh, so, um, I'm thinking about Joe Engel here because, you know, a few years ago, as they, um, we were in Bible study and, and, you know, and we began to lean into this of why does it say Christ Jesus? And um, because Christ is a title. It's not Jesus's last name. Um, it, it, um, it means anointed one. And, and the word, just so you know, this is a transliteration in Greek. This is Christos which is translating the Aramaic word Meshiach, Messiah, which just means anointed one. But in our story, God's story, out of the Old Testament, the anointed one is the son of David who's going to sit on David's throne forever. And so we know this anointed one is truly the king, but he's not just any king. He's king of kings and lord of lords. So now, when we see Christ, we're thinking Messiah. You probably think Savior, because, well, he happens to be the Savior. But what we should be thinking is King Jesus. Lord of Lords, King of Kings, the one who sits on the throne of David. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and... and and, and it, if for a while, you need just to remind yourself of that so it gets in. When Every time you think of it, you see Christ, go, King Jesus. That's who he is. Um, and, and so we have this sense of, of royalty. And Paul begins here um, as he's speaking to this church that lives in the capital of the province of Asia, you know, or the chief city, I should say, of the province of Asia, and um, which, you know, is a center of, of worship for the emperor. Well, we know of the emperor. In fact, Paul's in prison right now um, of this emperor. But he isn't um, a follower of the emperor. He's an apostle of King Jesus. And it reminds us of the conflict between the kingdoms of this world and the kingdom of God and the power structures of this world and the power... Uh, structure and the way of Jesus Christ. Now, then you're, you're, you're left there and you sit there and you go, but it says Christ Jesus and usually it says Jesus Christ. Well, there's two things. This is how Greek works. You can change the word order and it doesn't change the meaning. Um, typically, what we get is we get Jesus Christ when we get the full title of Jesus with Christ. Um, probably because the most important thing in our relationship to him is that we know him by name. And, and the name Jesus means God saves. And while he's our king, um, he's not far and distant, but his very spirit lives inside of us. But sometimes you want to emphasize that he's King Jesus. And at the opening of this letter, by the will of God, Paul's writing this letter to them, and he wants them to understand that their king has chosen Paul as his authoritative messenger to deliver this word to them. What, what that should do is it should wake us up. Woo! Jesus has words for us. This is important. To the saints in Ephesus. Now, through Christian history in the Roman Catholic Church, it's altogether possible that when you hear the word saint, you think of St. Teresa, or, or, or Mother, you know, so Mother Teresa. You think of, um, mm, oh, who's, who's another saint? Um, who's another saint? St. Francis. St. Francis of Assisi, sure. Um, now, 
that whole thing of the of of the tradition that the church emerged with Catholicism, and 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 at one point that was just all of our traditions, and and we go back to it, the whole church. Um, it, it, in my opinion, is 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 missing the point. It's great to celebrate people who follow Jesus. We want to do that, but calling them saints and 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 kind of excluding the rest of us from the idea of being saints completely misses the New Testament. the 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 way of holiness is not achieved by your accomplishment. It, so the word saint literally it's hagios. And hagios means holy, holy ones. And, um, and the idea of holiness in, in particular here is shaped by the Old Testament. Um, the ones who have been set apart for God, and, and not just simply separated out, but they are characterized by the very character of God. Pure, holy, um, righteous, good, Nobody's good but God, the Father, Jesus says. It's true. But you and I, we've been saved. And now, Panuma Hagia, the, and, and actually, the, the Panuma Hagias, the Holy Spirit, He is in you. And, and so, when it says saints here, it's not referring to a special class of Christians. It's actually referring to everyone who's a Christian hearing this letter in Ephesus, and now to you and to me. And we do not achieve sainthood by what we do. We receive it by trusting in Jesus Christ. So, we're, we're doing our Bible study. We're coming along. We're, we're looking at these words. We, what, what, you're, what you're seeing, and this is where this is taking a little bit of time, is, is that We've got to get to the right definitions. And sometimes we, 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 we read the word, and this is one of those things that if you haven't done a lot of Bible study and you read through the Bible, that there may be a whole bunch of things where it's really not speaking to you clearly because you, you don't have clarity over the message that's trying to be sent because you don't have clarity over the words. If you've heard the word saints and you think that it's a special class of Christians and it couldn't possibly be referring to you, no, no, you're missing this. But if you think of, I'm a saint, and that begins to shape your identity, and I'm a saint not because of what I've done, but because of the Holy Spirit in me, now I'm starting to live by grace. But because the Holy Spirit's in me and he's giving me power, I'm not choosing the way of sin. Why? Because that's not who I really am. I'm holy. I'm set apart. I'm living a different life. And so, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful the ones who believe, um, who put their trust, again, in our King Jesus, in Christ Jesus. Um, grace, typical, um, typical greeting. Um, almost, you know, almost all your letters written in uh, the in in Greek in the Greco-Roman time period. Um, you get the person, you get the audience. Paul adds a couple of words, um, and then you would get this word karin, which means greetings. Paul, very interestingly, never uses karin. He uses charis, which is the word for grace. It's, it's related to the word karin. But Paul doesn't want to just give you greetings. He wants to give you grace in Christ Jesus. And, and, he, and his, his mind, his life, been radically um, transformed by the power of Christ so that he he's thinking through the things that he's doing and saying, how do I do this as a Christian? We don't know really the thought process, but what we do know is the conclusion. At some point, Paul sat there and said, when I write a letter, I'm not just going to say greetings, but I'm going to say grace. And so he says grace and peace. Um, Arine, but probably a strong associated with the Hebrew idea of peace, which is shalom. Not just the cessation of war, but all of the circumstances that make the flourishing of life possible.
possible. That's biblical peace. Now, one of the things to know is, is that um, every word in Paul, it's a good idea to sit there and think it's probably not there by accident. He's not just probably doing something by rote. Dear John, his, his openings always are kind of preparing you for what's to come. He's got a word from King Jesus that's important for them to hear. It's a word that's going to call them, most likely, to live by faith, to live into their faithfulness. And, and he's going to want them to be established in peace about how they approach living, even in hostile circumstances. Um, now, it's not just the opening words, but then Paul does this other thing. Um, you, you, sometimes in letters you would get this, the, the person writing, the one that's being written to, the opening greeting, and then maybe a little blessing or something like that. But with Paul, you get this full-blown prayer. And, um, and that prayer tips the hand, and what you'll find is, is that the themes in that prayer end up getting worked all through whichever letter that you're writing. And so it's helpful to pay attention to this prayer. He's not, he's not praying randomly, he's praying specifically. And, um, and he's been thinking about this word that he's going to send, and he's been praying about this word that he's going to send. And so with that, woohoo! We got through introductory matters. Um, we got through two verses. Some of you have been with Bible study for me before, and sometimes getting through two verses is pretty good. Um, we're probably going to get through more than two verses uh, on Wednesday. Um, do we have any prayer requests? Yes, we have one. Tracy Parrish would like prayer for relief from her back and nerve pain. Mm. Um, she had her knee replaced eight weeks ago. Okay. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, and um, Lord, we lift up Tracy to you, um, and uh, Lord, as she's had this knee surgery, we give thanks for that, but as um, our body's all interconnected, and the way that we walk, and the way that we position our, our weight, um, you know, we often feel it in our back, and there's this pain that she has, and she's asking for relief. And so, Lord, we pray for your healing touch and also just um, wisdom. And, uh, Lord, if there's even uh, anything that uh, doctors could do. Um, but we do pray, Lord, that um, the pain would go away. Uh, her recovery from her knee surgery would go well. And we lift her up to you. Lord, um, we also pray for tomorrow night. And as Alpha kicks off, we uh, lift up. Um, this class of uh, participants. We pray your blessings and we pray, Lord, this opportunity of doing Alpha online. We lift up all the technical aspects of it well um, and pray that um, your gospel, your word goes forth and that there would be, and that everybody who participates um, will come to you and they will know you not simply as Lord but as their Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great and wonderful day. God bless.